Hungarian folk tales. Jack Crow. Once upon a time, a very long time ago, there lived an elderly couple who had nothing in the world except a young son they called Jack Crow. As soon as the boy was old enough to know his own mind, he told his parents, I've decided to go out into the world to find work with a wealthy family. His elderly parents did not protest and so Jack Crow set forth to seek his fortune. When he reached the edge of the village, he caught sight of a swarm of ants marching from one field to the next across the road. And right at the back, he saw a single lame ant that fell by the wayside and could not rejoin its friends. So Jack Crow helped the little ant back to its tiny feet. Thank you for your kind help, said the ant. In return for your good deed, I shall give you this whistle. Whenever you're in trouble, blow it and I'll come to your aid in an instant. So Jack Crow put it in his pocket and continued on his way. As the moon rose in the sky, he found himself in the middle of a vast forest where a white-haired old man lived in a small house. Good evening, old man, said Jack. Good evening to you too, son. What brings you to this distant place, the old man asked. I'm looking for a wealthy family who will employ me to work, but now I simply need shelter for the night, Jack Crow told him. So the old man let him stay for the night, and in the morning he gave him some wise advice. Well, my boy, you should follow the track through the forest where you will find a vast meadow. There you'll discover a giant mountain. On top of that mountain stands a castle crafted from pure gold, and that is where the king resides. I happen to know that the king needs servants, so I suggest you go there to seek employ. So Jack Crow thanked the old man and continued on his way. When he reached the edge of the forest, he noticed a flock of crows flying around something on the ground a little way ahead. There he found a crow flapping helplessly around because its feathers were heavy with morning dew and it could not get off the ground. Young Jack took pity on the bird, picked it up and petted and patted it until all its feathers had dried. Then the bird said, Now hear me, Jack Crow, you've done me a good deed, so in turn I shall give you this whistle. If you're ever in trouble, blow it and I shall come to your aid in an instant. Jack soon came to the foot of the mountain on the shores of the sea. As he stood and stared out, he saw the waves toss a fish from the waters that landed flapping on the ground. Jack took pity on the fish and gently helped it back into the salty water. When the fish was fully recovered, it said, in return for your good deed, you can expect another. I know you have two whistles already, so let me give you a third. If ever you're in trouble, blow it and I'll come to your aid in an instant. So Jack hurried to the castle on top of the mountain. There the king greeted him and asked, Well, what can I do for you, my fine fellow? I seek work with a wealthy family, your majesty. And the king said, In my kingdom, three days are the same as a full year. The payment is 300 florins and you can eat and drink your fill. But if you fail to obey my commands, I shall have you executed. On the first day, just after sunset, the king had Jack brought before him and said, Now hear me, Jack Crow. You are now my servant, so I command you go into the barnyard where you'll find three piles of millet. By morning, I want you to sort the seeds from the straw. If you fail to complete my command, I shall have you executed. Jack Crow was worried out of his wits. What should he do? Then he suddenly remembered the whistle the ant had given him and he blew it. Out of nowhere, a huge swarm of ants appeared. There were so many of them that not even a million men could have counted them. How can we help you, Jack, my friend? I've been given a task impossible to complete, Jack said. And he told the ant what the king had commanded. Have no fear, the ants told him. We'll get hard to work and sort all the seeds from the straw by morning. By the time the sun had risen in the morning sky, the millet seeds and the straw were in two separate stacks. The king said, I see you've done a good job, so now you are free for the rest of the day, but you must report to me again this evening. 
When evening came, the king said, My faithful servant, I command you to go to the front of my castle where my three daughters are strolling back and forth. I want you to make sure they come to no harm. If you fail your task, I'll have you executed. Jack did as he was bid and sat down in front of the entrance to the castle to keep watch over the three princesses. And as Jack sat there, he grew so bored and tired that he fell fast asleep. And the three princesses turned into crows and flew away. Young Jack woke with a start to see the girls had vanished. He was worried out of his wits until he remembered the whistle the crow had given him. He blew the whistle and a flock of crows arrived. How can we help you, friend? I am so very sad because I have a task impossible to complete. The king commanded me to watch over his three daughters, but I dozed off and all three princesses vanished, Jack replied. Fear not, the crows told him, we shall find them for you. Climb up on my back and we'll fly off in search of the three lost princesses. So Jack climbed onto the crow's back and they flew off into the distance, but the princesses were nowhere to be found. So then they flew behind the moon, where they saw the princesses in the shape of crows. Then Jack threw three reins around the crow's necks and led them slowly back down into the castle courtyard. On the evening of the third day, the king again ordered that Jack be brought before him. The king said, I command you to go and find the gold ring which fell off my finger today and rolled into the sea. If you fail the task, I'll have you executed. Jack knew that this was impossible to solve alone, and so he ran to the seashore where he blew on the whistle that the fish had given him. A shoal of fish appeared in an instant and asked, How can we help you, friend? There, Jack Crow quickly told them what he had been commanded to do. Don't worry, friend, said the king of the fish. We shall do our best to find that ring for you. The fish searched and dawn was almost breaking, but they still had not found the ring, until they found it in the belly of an enormous goldfish. Well, my faithful servant, said the king, you've done an honest job of serving me. In return, I will give you the hand of one of my daughters in marriage, half of my kingdom, and three cartloads of gold for good measure. However, Jack Crow did not want to marry and did not want half the kingdom, for all he wanted was the gold, and the king happily gave it to him. Jack Crow drove the three carts home to his beloved parents, where they ate good food and drank fine wine, and all lived happily ever after. the crayfish, the egg, and the cockerel. Once upon a time, a very long time ago, there was a little pin that was very bored in the sewing box. And the little pin thought it would go out and see the world. The pin walked and walked, and as it was walking along, it met a dog, and the dog said, Where are you going, friend? Why, I'm going out to see the world. Then I shall go with you too. Please do.
They walked and walked, and as they were walking, they met a crayfish. The crayfish said, Where are you going to, friend? Why, I'm going out to see the world. Then I shall go with you too. Please do. They walked and walked, and they were walking along when they met a rotten egg. The egg said, Where are you going, friend? Why, I'm going out to see the wide world. Then I shall go with you too. Please do. They walked and walked and they were walking when they met a cockerel. The cockerel said, Where are you going to, friend? Why, I'm going out to see the world. Then I shall go too. Please do. They walked and walked until they arrived in the back of beyond and night began to fall around them and the sky grew dark. The four of them looked for a place to lay their heads for the night, but they found themselves in a vast forest and searched and searched for a place to sleep. Then they caught sight of a cottage where they decided to go and ask for shelter. They walked into the cottage but found that it was empty inside. It doesn't matter that no one's at home, we can still sleep here for the night. And each found a place to lay its head. The pin stuck into a towel, the egg rolled into the ashes, the crayfish sat in the wash basin, the cockerel roosted on top of the fence, and the dog lay down on the shady porch. Then they all fell fast asleep because they were tired from all the walking they had done that day. The cottage was owned by three foxes that had gone down into the town to steal chickens from farms as the darkness descended. Now the three foxes came running home. As they ran, twigs cracked under their feet and the cockerel heard them approaching and crowed a warning to its friends. The foxes stopped for a second when they heard the crowing, but then they ran quickly on. Then the dog took notice and began to bark. The foxes stopped again when they heard the dogs barking. What could be happening at the cottage, they thought. But then they carried quickly on. When the foxes arrived, the cockerel crowed, the dogs snapped at their heels, but they carried quickly on into the cottage. But a terrible surprise still awaited them. The father fox said to its son, quickly go and look for a coal in the ashes, that we can light a lamp and see what's happening in the cottage. One of the fox's sons went to the fireplace and sorted through the ashes. But the egg blew up in the fox's face, so it ran to the basin for water where the crayfish lay that pinched the fox hard. It tried and tried to shake the crayfish from its paw. It grabbed the towel to dry itself and the pin pricked it sharply. Run away, we need to run from this terrible place. And the foxes ran and ran and ran away and may still be running till this very day. Thank you.
Hungarian folk tales. First the dance, then the feast. Once upon a time there lived a poor man. He had even more children than a sieve has holes. And he owned nothing more than a small house. But then the poor man was forced to move out of his home because his landlord wanted so much corn in payment for his rent that he had to leave. And so the poor man decided to hide. In the forest, he met an old man and the old man asked the poor man where he was going. The poor man told him about his landlord's cruelty. Don't be so sad, poor man, because I shall give you a fiddle, and whenever you play it, your landlord will dance. The poor man happily took the fiddle, but told the old man that he was still very hungry indeed and he could not return home with a fiddle. Then the old man gave him the gift of a table. Whatever you wish for will appear on this table. So the poor man slapped his hand hard on the table and shouted, <coughs> Porridge and beans. And when the poor man's belly was full, he set off to go home. When the poor man arrived, he discovered that his cruel landlord had already evicted his dear wife and darling children. Now I shall pay and you shall dance. And the poor man began to fiddle. And the poor man's landlord danced and danced and danced and grew very tired indeed. But as the poor man played as long as he could, his landlord kept on dancing. When the poor man took a rest, the landlord ran back to the mayor's office to report that he wouldn't stop fiddling. But the poor man followed the landlord back to the office and began to fiddle again. Dance, landlord, dance! Then the landlord danced into the office and shouted. The men in the office soon grew bored with the poor man's fiddling and they ordered him to leave at once. Now you should dance too, the poor man commanded. And everyone in the mayor's office began to dance around. They put down their pens and danced a merry jig together. Then the policeman heard the news and ran to the mayor's office. Get out of here, poor man! But the poor man shouted, Now you should dance too! And the policemen all began to dance around. The women sent word for policemen to come from the next village and these policemen soon arrived and tried to chase the poor man away. Now you should dance too! Now the whole marketplace was filled with people dancing around. Then the soldiers marched up and the poor man said, Now you should dance too, as best you can. of the dancing finally found its way to the king's ears. Now the king should dance too, the poor man demanded. So the king joined in the frantic dance. The queen of the kingdom contacted the king from the neighbouring land and this king arrived with his army and the country was soon filled with his foreign soldiers. The second king called upon the poor man to desist. The two dancing kings put their crowns down at his feet and gave him their lands. So peace returned and the dancing eventually ended.
Now all the dancers had grown so hungry and asked the poor man to feed them at last. The poor man took out his table, slapped it and said, Porridge and beans. Then everyone sat down to enjoy the meal and the tiny table made more and more and more of the food. The people standing next to the table were lucky, but the ones at the back could not reach the porridge pot, and the people pushed the kings into the beans. The king's shouts were soon drowned out, and both kings drowned in the big pot of beans. No one felt sad that the kings had gone, and all pushed forward to eat their fill. Everyone ate and ate till all was gone, and they all had a splendid time indeed. Once upon a time, in a faraway land, there lived a king. One day the king was out hunting in the forest and became so very lost that he could not find his way. I wish someone would lead me out of this frightening forest and I would give him a sack of gold for his troubles. Follow me and I will lead the way. And that's what he did. You should know, king, that I need neither money nor anything else but give me that what you have now, but did not have before you left your palace this morning. The king thought and thought that he must mean a cat or something simple like that. When the king arrived home, his servants ran out to meet him shouting, make haste your majesty, because you have a beautiful baby daughter, more radiant than the sun itself. But to make a long story short, the little man had said that he would only come to fetch the girl on her 15th birthday. When the king saw how pretty the princess was, he knew not whether to weep with joy or with sorrow. The queen said to him, Are you not happy? Oh yes, I'm happy, very happy, the king said, and he told her the story. Days became months and months became years and the princess grew. On her 15th birthday, the devil appeared because the little man was really the devil. Send your daughter out, king, for I have come to collect her at last. Oh dear, oh dear. The king and the queen wept and wailed. What can we possibly do? The gooseherd's daughter was also there, so they quickly dressed her in golden robes studded with diamonds. Then they put a crown on her head, opened the door and sent her out. The devil had a wheelbarrow that he made the girl sit in and he pushed her away. He pushed her past water where geese were swimming. When the geese saw the girl, they began to gaggle. Ga, 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 where are you going, goose girl? I'm going to hell and the devil's taking me. You're not the real princess, the devil asked. No, not at all. I'm the gooseherd's daughter. So the devil grew so angry that he tipped the girl from the barrow and left her there. The devil marched back to the royal palace. Listen, king, if you won't give me your daughter, I'll smash your door in. Oh dear, wailed the king and the queen. The swineherd's daughter was also there, so they quickly dressed her in golden robes studded with diamonds. Then they put a crown on her head, opened the door and sent her out. The pig soon began to grunt. Where are you going, pig girl? I'm going to hell and the devil's taking me. 
You're not the real princess, the devil asked. No, not at all. I'm the swineherd's daughter. Listen, king. Open the door and give me the princess, or else I shall set your palace on fire. The king and the queen were both terrified, so they dressed their daughter while they wept, and they pushed her out of the door. The devil was delighted. He put the girl straight into his barrow and wheeled her to hell. Once there, she met a boy called John, who had also been stolen away from somewhere. They were both forced to work hard. John toiled all day in the stable, and the princess did the cooking, the baking, the cleaning, and she looked after the devil. Time passed, and John and the princess spent all their time together. One day, John said, Princess, we should both run away from the devil. But how could we do that? I know a magic spell. I overheard the devil say it. I shall cast a spell on the broom and spit on it. Then the broom will answer for us when the devil tries to find us. That sounds like a wonderful plan. So they waited until the devil fell fast asleep, put the broom by the door, and John spat on its handle. <laughs> Speak for us when the devil calls us. Now the devil woke up. Where are you, princess? Bring me my clothes. I want to get dressed. Right away, the broom replied. The devil waited for a while and then called again. Are you bringing my slippers? What takes you so long? I'm coming right away. Wait until I catch you, you naughty child. Where are you, naughty girl? Here I am. Where are you, manservant? Quickly sit on a shovel and ride off after them into the sky. Catch them and bring them back to me. John, my left ear is itching. Look back. Oh dear, princess, the devil servant is after us and he's very close. Let us quickly do magic. I will be an old priest and you can become a church. And so that is what they did. Listen, old priest, have you seen young John and a princess passing this way? The old priest pretended to be praying. Abeles, corbeles, abeles, corbeles. Old priest, don't chant verse to me, but tell me if you have seen John and the young princess. Abeles, corbeles, abeles, corbeles. Then the devil's servant sat back on the shovel and flew back to hell. The young couple turned quickly back, the church became the princess and the old priest became John, and the two of them continued. Have you seen them? Could you reach them? Did you bring them back? I saw no one except an old priest and a church, but the priest was a fool and simply said, Arbales Corbales to all of my questions. Oh, that was them. Where is my other servant? He should sit on a hot iron and fly away after them. John, my right ear is itching. Look back. So John looked back and saw the devil's servant flying after them on a red-hot iron. Let us quickly make magic. You will become a cornfield and I shall become a farmer watching his golden field of corn. Then the devil's servant flew down from the sky. Listen, old farmer, have you seen young John and a princess passing this way? Shoo, shoo, sparrow, shoo, shoo. Shoo, pigeons, shoo, shoo, shoo. Old farmer, don't say shoo to me, but tell me if you have seen John and the young princess. Shoo, sparrow, shoo, shoo, shoo. Shoo, pigeons, shoo, shoo, shoo. The farmer's as mad as the priest, manservant said, and rode straight back to the devil. Did you see them? I saw no one except a field of corn and a wild farmer who shooed away all the birds. Oh, that was them, the rogues. I shall have to go myself. Oh, John, both my ears are itching now. Look back. Oh, princess, now the devil is hot behind us. Hurry, and you'll become a golden duck, and I'll become a pond. Now wait. I know who you are. I'll catch you and take you back. I swear I will. And the devil went into the water to catch the golden duck. But the duck kept swimming further in. The devil gave chase and swam further still until he reached the middle of the pond where the water was the deepest, and the devil drowned. Then they both changed magically back. The pond became John and the golden duck, the princess. Then they both went back to the princess's home. The king and the queen were overjoyed. They held a wonderful wedding and they all lived happily ever after. Thank you.
Once upon a time, in a far-off land, there lived a poor man who had three sons. The poor man had a tiny vineyard, but he owned no more than that. And he guarded his vineyard as if it were gold. His sons would also take turns to stand watch at the vineyard all day and all night. One morning, it was his eldest son's turn to guard the vineyard and the boy sat down and started to eat. While he was eating, a frog hopped out in front of him and said, Give me a bite of bread, young man. I haven't eaten for two long weeks. When pigs learn to fly, said the young fellow, and he chased the frog away. The frog left in silence and the boy fell fast asleep. When he woke again, the vineyard had been so badly ravaged that the boy was filled with fear. Next day, the middle boy went to the vineyard. He too was asked for bread by the frog, but he also chased the frog away and threw a stone at the beast. Then he lay down, fell asleep, and when he awoke, less than half the vineyard remained. Hey, the poor man moaned, all we have is this tiny vineyard and they can't even look after that. Then the youngest boy said, Worry not, father, what is left will be safe now, for I shall guard it. So the youngest son went to the vineyard, sat down to eat, and the frog hopped out and asked him for bread. But of course, here, take some. Then he broke off a crust and gave it happily to the frog. Eat, frog, for you are one of God's creatures too. You are a good boy and you will be rewarded for your kindness in time. Now I shall give you one copper, one silver and one golden rod. During the night, three horses will come. One with a copper mane, one with a silver mane and one with a mane of gold. They will come to trample your vines, but if you strike them with these rods, they will be tamed in an instant. The night came at last and the three horses galloped in, kicked and neighed and threw earth up into the starry sky. But the youngest son was soon to act and hit hard at them with all three rods. Then the horses were tame and stood and stared like three simple sheep. Don't hurt us, the horses pleaded. But should you need help, wave the rods in the air and we will appear. Then the boy went home. But the youngest son decided not to tell his brothers and his father of what had happened that night. All three were surprised by the crop that was so abundant they could barely gather it in. And no one in the village had vines as rich as theirs. Time passed slowly by, and one day the king decided to erect a pine tree outside the church. Then he placed a golden sprig of rosemary atop the pine tree and told the world that he would give his daughter's hand in marriage to the first man who could snatch the golden rosemary from atop the pine tree. All manner of men tried their hand, but none could jump higher than half the height required. 
And when all of them had crept away in shame, a fine fellow appeared on a copper-haired horse. He wore a copper helmet so his face could not be seen. Then he spurred his horse on, leapt high in the air, snatched the golden rosemary and rode away. The copper knight was the poor man's youngest son, of course. He went home in his tattered clothes and was sitting in the corner when his father and two brothers returned to the house because they too had witnessed the joust. His brothers told the youngest one what they had seen. I too saw what happened. But how is that so? Because I stood atop the fence and watched from there. His brothers were so furious that they smashed the fence to stop him watching again. The next Sunday, the king placed a golden apple on an even taller tree. Many men tried their hand, but all again in vain. But as they walked away in shame, a knight appeared aback a silver-haired horse, and the knight wore a silver helmet to hide his face. With one jump, he grabbed the golden apple and vanished. By the time his father and brothers returned, the youngest son was sitting in the corner again. They quickly regaled him of what they had seen, invisible to him from the corner. Oh, I saw it better than both of you. How is that so? I climbed atop the pigsty roof. The brothers were so furious that they tore the pigsty down to stop him watching from there again. The third Sunday came and the king put a golden scarf atop the tallest pine tree. And it was the poor man's youngest son who again snatched it off. He escaped and recognised again because he rode a golden-haired horse and a golden helmet to hide his face. At home, the brothers both bragged of what they had seen. I saw it better than both of you. How is that so? Where from? From atop the house roof, of course. His brothers were so furious that then they pulled the roof to pieces. Meanwhile, the king declared that the knight should appear who had taken the golden rosemary, the golden apple and the golden scarf. But the days became weeks, the weeks months, and no one came forth. Then the king summoned all the men in the land to his palace. But the famous knight was still not among them. All of them gone, a young man appeared with hair and clothes of gleaming gold. The golden rosemary in his hat, he led his horse with the golden scarf and he held the golden apple in his hand. Heaven, he had appeared at last. The king was delighted and the princess overjoyed. The wedding was held the very next day. The king gave the golden knight half of his kingdom and they all lived happily ever after. Once upon a time, there lived a woman who was very contrary. One day, her husband told her to take his lunch to the field an hour early. So instead, she took it out an hour late. Another time, he told her to take better food out to him. But instead, she took worse, 
Eventually, her husband learned to make his request backwards and said, Well, well, wife, do not bring stuffed chicken and pancakes to me today, because they are not the kind of food to eat out in the field. It's true his wife took the food out earlier that day, but she did take her husband his stuffed chicken and pancakes. The next day, her husband got hard to work and dug a deep pit at the end of the field. And the farmer's wife came to him with his food for lunch. The couple soon settled down next to the pit and the man said to his wife, Wife of mine, do not go near to the pit because you will surely fall into it. But the man's wife still ventured close to the pit. Wife of mine, take care and do not fall into the pit. But the man's wife fell right to the bottom of the deep pit. Ha ha! Then the man left his wife where she was and he went home for his supper. The contrary wife tried hard to climb out of the pit, but it proved pointless. I would even thank the devil if he got me out of here. Well, here I am, the devil said to the wife. I came to get you out. Climb onto my back. So the wife climbed onto the devil's back and he pulled her out of the pit. Then the devil said to her, now you can get off. And the woman said, I will not. So the devil said, then take good care because you will soon fall off. And the devil began to dash madly around the land. Soon the devil grew tired and he said to the woman, get off my back this minute. And the woman said, no, I will not. The devil was tired out and he said to the old woman, now get off my back. No, I will not. The devil was desperate and did not know what to do next. Then he saw a soldier riding by and said, Good hussar, if you can get this woman off my back, I will make you king. So the hussar got off his horse, walked cursing over to the woman and told her if she did not get off, he would cut her in two with his sharp sword. But the wife said, No, I will not. So the brave hussar fought the woman with his sword. Get off his back, good woman, or I will end your life. No, I will not. Then the hussar said, If you won't, then stay sitting on the devil. So then the woman said, No, I will not. And she leapt off the devil's back, and the devil vanished. The hussar went on his way the following day, and the devil was waiting for him under a bridge as he planned to crown him king. The devil saw the hussar riding towards him. He poked his head out from under the bridge and shouted, Fine hussar, the woman isn't still here, is she? She is not, do not fear. And as the hussar reached him, the devil said, Now I will make you king. You must go to the king's daughter and during your journey I will possess her soul. And then her hand will be promised to the man who can drive me out of her. But no one will be able to do this, only you. You simply have to say, Jump out because I want to take her. But should I possess another of his daughters, you must not drive me out, for then I will possess you, and you will never be free of me again. So now the hussar travelled to the town where he heard the news that the king's daughter had been possessed by the devil. The decree was made that whosoever could drive the devil out would get the princess and half the kingdom. The hussar was delighted by this news and so he reported to the palace saying he could drive the devil out. He said to the devil, Jump out, devil, because I want to take her. Then the devil jumped out right away and plans were made for the royal wedding.
years passed and the news came that the devil had now possessed the king's second daughter. The hussar was asked to go out, but he was unwilling because he remembered what the devil had told him before. The hussar was promised treasure and many jewels, and so he eventually went. There he said to the devil, Devil, jump out of there too, because I want to take her. The devil jumped out right away and was about to attack the poor hussar when he stamped hard on his foot and said, Do you hear, devil? That woman is coming. Hearing this, the devil began to run and run and ran away forever and a day. Folk tales. The Magic Mill. Once upon a time, there lived a poor old man who had more children than there are holes in a sieve. His oxen were so small that they were barely any bigger than grasshoppers. The poor man and his wife spent all their days and nights worrying about how they would feed their very large family. One day, the poor man hitched his tiny two oxen to his tiny cart and went into the forest. The poor man was busy collecting dry branches and stacking them neatly on the back of his cart when he caught sight of a boy and a girl playing in a clearing close by. And the children began to talk to him. The poor man soon learned that the girl was the daughter of the King of the Sunrise and the boy the son of the King of the Sunset. As the three of them chatted away, the boy noticed the two tiny oxen. The little prince was so besotted with these miniature beasts that he begged the poor man to sell them to him. The young prince appealed and pleaded and promised the poor man that his father, the king, would reward him richly, and so the poor man eventually agreed. When the poor man arrived home without the oxen, there was an almighty argument and his wife was so angry with her husband that he turned on his heels and left the house for the court of the King of the Sunset. The poor man arrived to see the prince playing with the two tiny oxen. Come, kind sir, come, said the prince, and let me give you some advice. No matter what my father offers you, you should refuse it and insist that he gives you the magic mill in payment. So the poor man went to the king who said, Your two tiny oxen give my son such great joy and pleasure that you may have whatever you ask. Then the poor man noticed that the magic mill was on the table and it was so very small that it looked like a child's toy. So the poor man said, Your majesty, the only thing I wish to have in return for my two tiny oxen is this tiny mill on your table. The king said, Sir, you may have whatever you wish for, but not that. Now then, thought the poor man, this tiny mill isn't a toy after all, as the king does not want to part with it. The poor man humbly added, Your Majesty, please let me have this tiny mill so that my children may also have a toy to play with. The king loved his own child very dearly, so he agreed to give the poor man the mill. Then the prince said, Kind sir, you should leave for your home now, and when you arrive back, place the mill on the table and say, Magic Mill, give me gold and food to eat. And when the mill has made enough, you simply say, Magic Mill, stop your magic now. The 
poor man was delighted with his prize. He then thanked the prince for his kindness, put the tiny mill under his arm and hurried home so quickly that his feet never touched the ground. He was on his way home when he saw something large and black looming towards him, but he could not for the life of him guess what it was. And what do you think it was? It was a horrible, huge, black hat. Underneath the hat was a man, and the poor man joked with him and said, Good day, good friend. Isn't that hat too tight for you? The hatted man replied, Instead of mocking me, sir, why don't you give me a bit of bread because I haven't eaten for three days straight? The poor man said, But I don't have any food with me either. But then he remembered the magic mill and said, Magic mill, give me good food to eat. The poor man had barely finished speaking when so much food appeared that there was enough to feed a village for a week. Magic Mill, stop your magic now! Then the two men ate and talked a while until the hatted man said, Good sir, your mill is a magical thing indeed, but my black hat also has spectacular powers. Ask for one of anything and it will give you two instead. I will trade my hat for your mill. Sir, I'm not a fool. That's what you think, just watch this, said the man in the hat. Fire! Enough! Yes, said the poor man. I see your hat is quite splendid. But a hat such as that would not save me from starvation. But the hatted man appealed and pleaded with the poor man until he eventually agreed to the exchange. When the hatted man walked away, he also left a stick lying on the ground. The poor man was left feeling cheated and sad when the stick suddenly spoke up and said, Why so sad, master? I'm sad because I have lost the little sense I was born with, and I'm sad because I have lost my magic mill that I was foolish enough to swap for a hat. Then, in an instant, the stick hurried away and reappeared with the magic mill. And so the poor man had no reason to feel sad a moment longer. When the poor man returned home, his family surrounded him and rejoiced when they learned that the mill had magic powers. Days and months passed and one day the poor man was standing at his gate when he saw the king approaching on foot with his wife and son. The poor man asked the king, Where to, your majesty? Where are you walking on foot? The king replied, We're in very great trouble. The king of the north has invaded my kingdom and I have been forced to flee my home with my beloved family. But don't be sad over such a little matter, your majesty. I will mend matters in no time at all. Then the poor man put the huge hat on his head, took the stick in his hand and set off to find the king of the north's soldiers. It was not long before he stumbled across them because the king of the sunset's kingdom was crowded from border to border by the soldiers. Then the poor man climbed to the top of a hill, pointed his huge black hat in the direction of the enemy and commanded, Hat! Fire! He then sent his stick after the men to beat their behinds to make them run faster still. The carnage was incredible and not a single soldier of the King of the North survived to tell the tale of what had happened that day. Having destroyed the enemy, the poor man turned and made his way home, where he told the king what he had done and that he could return to the Sunset Kingdom. Then the king purchased the hat and the stick from the poor man and made his way back to his royal home. So now the Sunset Prince married the Sunrise Princess. They had a wonderful wedding and the poor man led the dancing and if his legs can stand it, he is still dancing to this very day.
Hungarian folk tales. Little Diogenes. When I was a little lad, my father sent me out to the forest to watch the cows grazing. He told me to keep a close eye on the herd because if any of the cows strayed away, he'd skin me alive. I tried to watch them as best I could, but I found a blackberry bush by the edge of the forest with ripe berries on it that were big and fat and black. Well, like I said, I was only a lad, and I instantly forgot what my father had said and set to work eating as many berries as I could manage. And while I stood feeding my face, the two cows strayed away from the grass meadow and began to make a meal of valuable hay. And just as that was happening, the devil sent the local constable, who cracked his whip and drove those two stray cows away from the hay they shouldn't have eaten. I gave chase as best I could and appealed to the menacing man. Constable, please, they're my father's cows. Let them go with me. But the man took no notice at all and saddled his horse and rode away. He set out for the town and I followed him as best I could on foot, but he was soon far out of sight. So what was I to do? I couldn't stand before my father without his precious cows. I thought it best to run away instead and drown my sorrows as best I could. So I sat on a pile of pebbles by the side of the road and wept and wailed, for I was still only a lad and I'd had to leave home. Soon a woman passed and she said, Why are you weeping, young lad? What on earth occurred? So I told her of my troubles and that I did not dare to return home or else my father would surely skin me alive. My parents would never see me again and I would be orphaned and homeless. Don't be so foolish, young lad, said the woman. A parent's punishment strengthens the soul, but a blow from a stranger only bruises a boy's body. Now take yourself home before it gets dark. I will not, I told her boldly. When the woman saw that she spoke to me in vain, she washed my filthy face, then she took me by the hand and led me to a large stone house. When we reached the kitchen, she placed a plate of steaming porridge before me, but my belly was so filled with berries that I couldn't swallow as much as a spoonful. But I didn't dare leave it, because I thought she'd think me ungrateful. So I took the porridge and spooned it under my shirt. Then after I'd fed my shirt this fine supper, I lay down by the stove to warm myself. And as I lay in the snug, my sadness slowly slipped away, and I was happy to have found comfort in the kitchen of this motherly woman. But it wasn't long before her husband returned, who was not what I'd call a fatherly man. As he caught sight of me lying on the blanket, he complained to his wife, Why have you brought another hungry mouth to the house? But he's nothing more than a lost lad. I thought he could help about the farm. Help? With what? A skinny thing like him will eat us out of house and home. Hey you, get up and lift up this sack of corn. I want to see if you're strong enough to be of service here. I tried to lift the heavy sack, but my eight years proved not enough to lift the heavy weight. But I was soon undone when my belt burst open, my shirt shot out of my trousers, and a pool of porridge landed on the floor. You filthy thief! You have stolen from us on your very first day here. And he took out a whip to give me a thrashing. The wife begged him to spare me, but instead he grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and stuffed me into a barrel. Then he sealed the barrel tight and rolled it far from the house so that no one passing would hear my cries.
And there you'll stay, you filthy thief, and tomorrow I'll have you locked in jail, he snarled. I was now stuck tight inside the barrel and could do nothing more than groan and moan. But then in my hour of greatest need, I remembered a lesson we'd had at school about a wise old man by the name of Diogenes, who used to live in a barrel much as this. Then I thought of a plan. I had a knife in my pocket and I could wedge it in between the staves, but the barrel was made of old oak and the wood was so hard that my knife broke. Then I sighted a fox that alighted in the garden. The chicken shed was closed and so the fox began to nose around my barrel. The fox appeared at the very best time as I had an idea that made me feel as wise as old Diogenes. And I started to make a noise like a laying hen. Cluck, 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 cluck. What a good place to sit. Instead of eggs, I'm sitting atop a pile of sweet honeycomb. Oh, my dear little hen, would you give your friend the fox a taste of that sweet honey you have? Of course, my foxy friend. Simply stick your tail in and I shall smear it with sweet honey that you can lick off later. The foolish fox did just as I suggested and popped its tail in through the hole that I grabbed and held onto with all my might. The hen thief thought it was caught for good and began to leap about the place. And it leapt and jumped, jumped and leapt until the barrel had broken apart. Free at last, I ran and ran until I found home. My parents were happy that I had returned. My father gave me a harsh beating for my sins and not watching over his valuable cows. But my mother rubbed my back with soothing cream and I continued to grow in my loving home. Once upon a time, there lived an old woodcutter who was poorer than a mouse. One day, the woodcutter said to his wife, Wife of mine, please bake me two corn cakes that I can take them out to work with me so that I won't have to come home to eat. So the woodcutter's wife baked the cakes, put them in the woodcutter's bag, and he set off to work in the forest. Down in the forest lived old Paluto, and old Paluto had a young son called Pinko. Pinko listened keenly to the sound of the woodcutter's axe and watched the old woodcutter from the shadows. Then the crafty boy took the woodcutter's bag down and gobbled up both the corn cakes. But old Paluto got wind of what his son had done. Where are you, Pinko? Old Paluto called out to his son. Here I am, father. Come quickly, where have you been? I have just gobbled up the old woodcutter's corn cakes. As you felt no pity for the poor woodcutter, you will now have to serve for three long years in return. Do you understand? This news saddened Pinko, but he agreed to do his father's bidding. So he turned on his heels and went back to the woodcutter. When he arrived, he said, Woodcutter, I am the one who ate your corn cakes. So be happy, my child, and don't sound so sad. But it doesn't work like that because my father has punished me and told me that I should work as your servant for three long years. There is no need, my child, because I could never pay you, but I can earn my own living. And wonder of wonders, Pinko plucked the trees from the ground and knocked them together to make neat logs to be stacked.
By the time night came, he had cleared the whole forest. Can we go home now? Yes, but first I want to gather some sticks for the fire. Pinko set hard to work and gathered up so much firewood that even 20 oxen could not have carted it home. Then he lifted the poor woodcutter up and placed him on top of the pile. The very next day, the poor woodcutter went to the rich farmer to tell him that he had felled, cut and stacked all the wood for winter. The farmer was reluctant to believe him and so he sent servants to see for themselves. They returned in the evening and informed him that the forest had been cleared and neatly stacked for winter. So the rich farmer was forced to pay the poor woodcutter. Then the woodcutter made his way home where he and Pinko agreed that they should seek work with the Baron the very next day. You came at the very best time, the Baron told them, because the field I have to plough would take a hundred men a year and a day to complete. So the old man went to the market with Pinko where they purchased two young calves and then went back to the field to plough it. There were very many men ploughing with a dozen oxen. So Pinko strode out to the middle of the field and by noon he had already ploughed more than all the other men put together. The other workers were so impressed by Pinko's calves that they asked for what price he would gladly sell them. But Pinko was proud of the calves and asked for a sack of gold along with the twelve oxen. They bargained and bargained until the Baron agreed to pay Pinko's asking price. The sack of gold was measured out for him, he was given the twelve oxen and then he was sent on his way. The Baron's men began to plough the land with the two calves, but however they pulled and pushed the tiny beasts, they would not work. They quickly reported the bad news to the Baron, who ordered them to search for Pinko and bring him back at once. The men soon caught Pinko. Then Pinko took the handle of the plough in one hand, cracked his whip with the other, and the calves began to plough as never before. This is how you should do it, he told them, and he went home. Back at home, he and the woodcutter discussed where Pinko should next seek work, and they agreed that he should visit the king the very next day. You came at the very best time, the king told them, because the corn I have to thresh would take a hundred men a year and a day to complete. They went to the barn that was piled to the rafters with corn to be threshed. But Pinko grabbed one stack and threshed it in no time at all. Then he took all the rest of the wheat, oats, millet and barley and threshed it all before the day was done. Then Pinko went to the king to tell him the corn was threshed. Oh, but you shouldn't have done it like that. Why, what did I do wrong? The wheat, the barley, the oats and the millet should be separate. That's no matter. I shall sort them apart. And no sooner had he spoken than, wonder of wonders, the grain all stood in neat piles. What payment do you ask for your hard work, son? Only one sack of wheat, Pinko said. Very well, you may come and collect it whenever you wish. Pinko returned home and he and the woodcutter gathered all the canvas they could find and spent a week sewing the sack. Now let's go and collect our payment. The next day they reported to the king who ordered his bailiff to fill Pinko's sack with wheat in payment for his work. Then they went to the barn and began to fill the sack and shovel all the grain in that Pinko had threshed. But that was only enough to fill one small corner of the sack. So the farm bailiff went back to the king and told him the size of the sack that Pinko had sown. The king said, 
I have agreed, and so I shall pay, but he will never be able to take the big sack away with him. So the men continued to fill the sack with last year's grain and the grain from the year before, and the sack still was not full when they had used up wheat from the last ten years. What kind of king is this man who cannot pay me for an honest day's work? Pinko complained to the bailiff. Then Pinko took the enormous shack and swung it over his shoulder, and he and the poor woodcutter left for home. They walked away without even saying goodbye, and when they got home, there was much celebration. Now they had grain, wood, oxen and gold, and could at last live a happy life. As the months turned to years, Pinko said to the woodcutter, I have been with you now for three long years, so I will leave you in the morning. The woodcutter pleaded and appealed for him to stay, but Pinko left for home. And when Pinko got home, there was much celebration, and they all lived happily ever after. Once upon a time, there lived a merchant, a king, and a poor man. The merchant often went hunting in the forest, and one day he became so very lost that he wandered around for three whole days, unable to find his way home. He said, Oh, if only someone would show me the way out, I'd give him the hand of the most beautiful of my three daughters in marriage, and three sacks of gold. I'll show you the way out if you follow me. The merchant looked down at his feet and saw a snuffling hedgehog. Then the merchant was forced to promise the hedgehog his most beautiful daughter's hand and three sacks of gold if he would lead him out of the forest. Then the hedgehog set out, followed by the merchant, and they reached the edge of the forest in no time. The following day, the king also went hunting in the forest, and he also got lost, much like the merchant the day before. The king said, if only someone would show me the way out, I'd give him the hand of the most beautiful of my three daughters in marriage, along with three carts of gold. I'll show you the way out if you follow me. The king looked around to see where the voice was coming from and then saw the hedgehog by his feet. He was so anxious to get out of the forest that he couldn't care less who it was, so he followed the hedgehog and they soon reached the edge of the forest. The following day, the poor man also got lost in the forest. Oh dear, I have nothing to my name, but even if an ugly beast showed me the way out of this forest, I would willingly adopt it as my own dear child. I'll show you the way out if you follow me, a voice said. The voice, of course, came from the hedgehog, and it led the poor man to the edge of the forest in no time at all. Time passed, and the merchant, the king, and the poor man had almost forgotten about the little hedgehog. One night, after the poor man had gone to bed, someone knocked on his window. Father dear, please open the door for me. Who can that be, the poor man wondered, because he knew he had no children. Hello, father. I finally come home, the hedgehog said. Welcome, son. I'm happy you're here, said the poor man. I am too. And would you please wake my dear mother to make my bed for me?
Father dear, do you have two pennies? The hedgehog asked. Yes, I do, my son, said the poor man. Well then, please go into town and in the marketplace you'll find a very old lady selling a black cockerel. Buy it for me, said the hedgehog. Then go to the saddler, who has a worn-out saddle, and buy that for me too. So the poor man went into town, bought the black cockerel and the worn-out saddle, and took them home where the hedgehog saddled the cockerel, climbed up onto its back, and rode away as fast as the wind. The hedgehog didn't stop until it reached the home of the merchant, where it said, Merchant, sir, open the door and let me in. The merchant nearly fell over backwards when he saw the hedgehog, but he had to let it in. Then he called his three daughters and told them of the promise he had made to the prickly creature. The merchant's daughters cried and cried, but the hedgehog paid no attention and chose the most beautiful girl and tried to comfort her with the following words. You are mine and I am yours, till death do us part. But the pretty girl refused to repeat his words and cried so much that she threw herself down on the ground. But protest as she might, the girl was forced to leave home with the hedgehog. Then the merchant harnessed the horses, put three sacks of money into another cart, and off they went with the hedgehog proudly riding its black cockerel alongside. Are you still crying? I am, and I will cry until my dying day. In that case, said the hedgehog, Go back to your father. But the hedgehog kept the three sacks of gold and took them home to the poor man. Time passed until the day eventually came when the hedgehog saddled its black cockerel and rode off to visit the king of the land. The hedgehog told the king why it had come, hoping the king remembered his promise. I only wish I had forgotten, but I haven't, and I always keep my word, said the king. He called his three daughters and sadly told them what had happened to him in the forest, and now this prickly creature had come here to pick his most beautiful daughter for his wife. It may think I'm the most beautiful, but I refuse to be a hedgehog's wife. I'd rather die than be a hedgehog's wife. I'll be only too happy to be its wife because it was so kind to my dear father. The king was happy and sad at the same time. He was glad one of his daughters had turned out to be so kind-hearted, but was sad to lose his only kind-hearted daughter. The king loaded silver, gold and diamonds onto three carts, harnessed horses to the royal coach and the princess climbed in. The hedgehog, however, did not go in the coach but rode alongside on the black cockerel. They had been riding for many hours and were far away from the palace when the hedgehog looked into the coach and was surprised to see the princess happy and not crying. She said, Why do you insist on riding that black cockerel instead of sitting beside me here in the coach? Aren't you afraid of me? the hedgehog asked. Why should I, when I know you will do me no harm? she replied. Don't you find me ugly? asked the hedgehog. Of course not, the princess replied. Then a miracle happened. The hedgehog shook itself and immediately turned into a tall and handsome prince who beamed brighter than the sun. Then the cockerel shook itself and turned into a fabulous stallion. And a palace appeared with walls and windows made of sparkling diamonds. Then they sent for the king, they sent for the poor man, and they sent for everyone in the land to join them at their wonderful wedding feast. And they all lived happily ever after.
Hungarian folk tales. The diligent girl and the lazy girl. Once upon a time, there lived an old man and an old woman, and each had a daughter from their previous marriage. The old woman was always angry with her husband's daughter and did not like her the slightest bit. Things went from bad to worse until one day the old woman chased the girl away from home saying that she should seek work with a rich family. The girl walked and walked and was walking past a pear tree when the tree spoke to her. Where are you going? I'm going to find a job as a servant with a rich family, the young girl replied. Come here and rid me of my dry branches and I will do you a good deed in return. Then the young girl walked on her way until she passed a grapevine and the vine spoke to her. Come here and hoe around my roots and I will do you a good deal in return. Then the young girl walked on her way until she passed a crumbling oven. Please come here and make me tidy and clean and I will do you a good deed in return. Then the young girl walked on her way until she came across a broken down well. Where are you going? I journey to find work. Please come here and make me tidy and clean and I will do you a good deed in return. So the young girl did as she was bid and bailed the stale water out of the well and walked on her way until she met a tiny dog. And the dog said, Please wash me, brush me and trim me and I will do you a good deal in return. The young girl cleaned and trimmed the dog and the dog thanked her and she walked on her way until she saw a beautiful house. There were fairies living in the house. The fairies asked the purpose of her journey and so the young girl told them. Then the fairies said, why don't you stay here and become our servant? There are seven rooms. You have to sweep out six rooms every day, but you must never go to the seventh room. So the young girl worked for a year and a day, and at the end of the year, the young girl said, I would like to leave now and go home to show my parents what I've earned. You have been a faithful maid, the fairy said. You did as you were told, so now we will tell you what you have earned. Come here and lie down atop these gold coins. Roll over and whatever sticks to you is yours. And now go and roll over on the silver coins and whatever sticks to you is yours. The girl did as she was told, then stood up and bid farewell to the fairies. On her way home she came across the little dog again that said, Come here and take as many pearls as you wish. The dog was covered in pearls and the young girl took the pearls and hung them around her neck. She walked on her way until she reached the well again, where jugs hung so that people could drink from its sweet water. The young girl was thirsty and so she took a drink and walked on her way. When she reached the oven again, she noticed it was filled with bread and cake and the oven said, Come here and eat your fill in return for your good deed. She ate as much as she could, packed more to take home, and then walked on her way. Next she reached the grapevine that hung heavy with ripe fruit. So here the girl stopped and ate and drank as much as she could. Then the girl walked on her way again until she came to the pear tree and the pear tree said, I've been waiting for you as all my pears are ripe. As the girl neared home, the cockerel crowed to announce her arrival. 
Cock-a-doodle-doo, my mistress is coming home covered in silver and gold. The young girl heard the cockerel's call and ran home to bring joy at last to her old father. Cock-a-doodle-doo, my mistress is coming home covered in silver and gold. The old woman shouted, Be quiet! That's not true! Once again the cockerel said, Cock-a-doodle-doo, my mistress is coming home covered in silver and gold. The old woman said, You've earned very nicely indeed, but now my own daughter will go forth and work for a rich family, and she will earn a great deal more than you've managed. When the old woman's daughter reached the pear tree, it said, Come here and rid me of my dry branches, and I will do you a good deal in return. The girl said, I will not ruin my pretty white hands and my lovely tiny feet, no matter what happens. When the girl reached the grapevine, it asked her to hoe its roots and to expect a good deal in return. But once again, the girl refused to do anything that might ruin her pretty white hands and her lovely tiny feet, no matter what happened. Next, she reached the oven. The oven asked her to repair it and it would do her a good deed in return. But the girl said she would not ruin her pretty white hands and her lovely tiny feet with disgusting mud and clay, no matter what happened. Next she came to the broken down well. Please come here and make me tidy and clean. But again she refused to dirty her pretty white hands and her lovely tiny feet, no matter what happened. <laughs> then she met the little dog that said, Come here and trim me. But she refused to touch the dog because she would not dirty her pretty white hands and her lovely tiny feet, no matter what happened. Next she reached the beautiful big house and asked that she be allowed to sleep there for the night. The fairies living there asked her where she was going, and so she told them. In reply, they asked her to stay and work as their maid. They said, Here there are six rooms, and you must sweep them every day, but you must never enter the seventh room. The girl did as she was told and swept the six rooms every day and ignored the seventh. But after a while, her curiosity forced her to open the door to the seventh room. To her horror, she saw that it was filled with frogs and snakes and they bit her and stung her so terribly that by the time she managed to escape, she was covered in blood. And so she left the fairy's house with no payment at all. On her way home, she met the dog and went up to ask for some pearls. The dog said, you refuse to help me and now I refuse to help you. The girl reached the well and was very thirsty but was not allowed to drink. When she reached the oven, it was packed with fresh bread and cakes, but she could not eat any of them, because when she reached inside for some, it burned her hands terribly. When she reached the grapevine, she tried to pick a bunch of grapes and to drink a glass of wine, but the grapevine pushed her hand away. And when she reached the pear tree, she could not pick a single pear. As she neared home, the cockerel caught sight of her and flew to the top of the fence and let it be known to everyone that Cock-a-doodle-doo, my mistress is coming all covered in blood. The old woman went to the fence and said, That's not true, she's covered in gold. But the cockerel repeated, Cock-a-doodle-doo, my mistress is coming all covered in blood. The old woman said, That's not true, because she's covered in gold. The cockerel repeated, Cock-a-doodle-doo, here comes my mistress all covered in blood. That's not true, that's not true, shouted the old lady. But the old man said, Now you can see that my daughter earned more as a maid than yours ever did. This led to such a quarrel that the old woman and her daughter left the old man's home. Then the old man and his daughter lived happily ever after. Hungarian folk tales. 
the astronomer, the thief, the huntsman and the tailor. Once upon a time there lived a poor man. And the poor man had four sons. But the poor man was so poor that he had no money to keep his sons. One day the poor man said, The time has come for you to leave home and seek your fortunes. You should all go and learn a trade. So the four sons set off into the wide world. The sun soon came to a crossroads that branched off into four different directions. So the sons agreed to part company and all meet back at the crossroads in a year and a day. Time passed and each of the sons studied a trade. The first son became an astronomer. The second a thief. The third was a huntsman and the youngest, a tailor. So they met again after a year and a day and they journeyed back home to tell their father of the jobs they now all had. Well done, sons. I believe you all, but I still would like to see proof of the new trades you practice. You, my son, the astronomer, what do you see on top of that tree? I see a nest with five eggs and a golden bird is sitting on them. You, my son, the thief, if that is indeed your trade, go now to the nest and steal the eggs from under the golden bird without ruffling a feather on its head. So the thief climbed up the tree and succeeded in stealing the eggs unseen. And he gave the eggs to his father. The old man put the eggs on the table. He placed one egg at each corner and then put the fifth egg in the middle. You, my son, the huntsman, if that is indeed your trade, shoot each egg with one shot and split them in two. So the huntsman shot and hit all five eggs in turn. Well done, son. You are a master of your craft. You, fourth son, the tailor, if that is indeed your trade, stitch all five eggs back together so that the chicks inside each survive. So the tailor stitched the eggs back together and did an excellent job of work but they would not know if all was well until the eggs eventually hatched. Now, thief, you must put the eggs back under the golden bird unnoticed. The thief succeeded and only a few days later all five eggs hatched out and the golden bird was delighted with the chicks. But each chick had a tiny red band around its neck where the tailor had stitched them back together. Now, my sons, you have proven your trades to me, but now you must prove them to the wide world. News soon came that the princess was lost, so the astronomer's son took out his spyglass and saw the pretty girl sitting on a rocky island in the middle of a vast ocean. And he saw a fierce dragon sleeping on the princess's lap. So the astronomer's son went directly to the king and requested a boat to rescue his royal daughter. The four sons voyaged to the rocky island where they discussed how best to save the princess. The tailor son suggested they shoot the dragon, but the astronomer's son was worried that they would hit the pretty princess. But you, thief, if you could steal the eggs, steal her from the dragon. And the thief stole the princess unseen. Then they took the girl onto the boat and sailed slowly back to the shore. But that is when the dragon awoke and the fearsome beast caught sight of them 
The princess had gone, and the dragon flew after them. The dragon saw that the boat was nearing the shore and knew that the princess must be on board, so it swooped down to the boat. But the huntsman's son saw the mighty dragon coming, and he shot it in the heart. Then the dragon fell from the sky onto the boat and smashed it into smithereens, leaving only a few planks of floating wood that the sons held onto. Then the huntsman said, We'll surely perish in these waters. So the tailor's son swiftly stitched the boat back together and everyone aboard survived. The old king was a very happy man when he saw his daughter again and he asked the four young men, which one of you deserves my daughter's hand? The astronomer's son said, me sire, for I sighted her in the middle of the ocean. The thief said, me sire, for I stole her quietly away. Seeing her was not enough, brother, if you weren't brave enough to go and get her. Then the huntsman said, getting her was not enough, because if I hadn't shot the fearsome dragon, it would have eaten us all up. Then the tailor said, Only I deserve the princess, sire, because if I hadn't stitched the boat back together, we would have all surely drowned. And the brothers began to fight. So the old king said, I cannot grant my daughter's hand to all four of you, and so instead I shall grant you each a portion of my kingdom. Will that suffice? Because the princess is very pretty, but living in peace is better still. So all four sons received a quarter of the kingdom and they all lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales The Gold Coin and the Hat I want to tell you the story of three young men and a hat. The three young men were all big bearded fellows and one day they decided that the time had come to go out and seek their fortunes in the great wide world. They walked and walked until they came to a little village. And as they neared the village, they met an old man. And one of the young men said, how many days are there in the world, old man? One less with today, young man, the old man replied. And are there any good men left in the world? Roses still bloom even when they're surrounded by weeds. Now that was clever, the young man said. I'll ask you one more question. What does an old man have under his hat? Come to the inn, young men, and I'll tell you there. The young men were penniless, but they still went with the old man. But the old man was the first to enter, and he told the innkeeper to keep pouring them wine until they had five florins worth. So all four men took a seat at the table and the innkeeper poured wine and they drank it and had a very jolly time indeed. But when they had drunk five florins worth, the innkeeper stopped serving them and politely asked, Now gentlemen, who will pay for all this fine wine? The young men would have willingly paid, but they were penniless. So then the hat will pay, the old man said. 
and he took off his hat, shook it, and a gold coin fell out. The young men were very surprised by this sight and keen to get their hands on the old man's valuable hat. Then all they would have to do was to shake it and the ground would be covered in gold coins. They pleaded and appealed to the old man to sell them his hat and to name his prize. Very well, the old man said. You can see that I am indeed an old man, and so 500 florins would be enough for the few years I have left. So that is my prize for the hat, young sirs. The young gentleman all ran to the count and asked to borrow 500 florins, and the count was happy to comply. So they paid the old man the price for the hat, and he went home. Then the hearty young fellows continued to eat and drink and make merry until a very late hour that night. And when the time came to pay, they shook the old man's hat, but nothing fell out. Not even a single gold coin. What were the poor fools to do? They could not pay, and so the innkeeper made them all stay and work to pay for the wine they had drunk that night. The moment the innkeeper let them go, they hurried to find the old man who had sold them the hat. Let's go and look for him in the village and we'll teach that old man a lesson for cheating us so. The old man got wind of their arrival and tried to hide all over the house, but his wife still found him wherever he hid. Then his wife said to him at last, You silly old fool, don't try and hide. It's much better if you pretend to be dead. Lie on the bench and I shall put a sheet over you. And when the young men come, I shall tell them that you're dead and they will not be able to do a thing with a dead man. So that's exactly what they did. And the wife began to weep for her dead husband. Oh, my dearest darling husband, why did you die and leave me here all alone? When the young men appeared, they asked the wife why she was crying so. What happened? Why are you crying, old lady? How could I not cry, my dears? My husband is lying dead on the bench and I am left here to fend for myself alone. But do not mourn his loss, for he was a terrible rogue. But then one of the young men sighted a stick in the corner of the room and he could not resist giving the old man's body a prod. Take that, you scoundrel, for the money you stole from us. Then the old man leapt up and put his hands together in thanks. Oh, God bless you, gentlemen. Behold, now I believe in the miraculous power of the stick. Listen here. I was walking in the fields one day when I saw a dead dog lying there. I prodded the dead dog with this selfsame stick and it jumped up and ran away. But now I know better than ever that this stick has the power to perform miracles. Wife, give these young men all we possess and we will keep only this stick. Then, when a rich man dies, I will raise him back from the dead and be richly rewarded for my miraculous deed. Not so fast, the young man said. We don't want your possessions, we want your miraculous stick. The old man was not willing to hand it over at first, but then he agreed. You made fools of us once before, but never again. God bless you, old man. Then the old man laughed and gave them the stick. The young men were walking back through the village when they passed the house of the Count. There they saw a hearse and six horses about to set off in a funeral procession. So the young gentleman asked who was about to be buried. The people told them, why, the young countess, of course. There you can see her mother, father, and handsome bridegroom standing behind the coffin. The young men did not waste a minute and ran up to the old countess. They demanded that she open the coffin that instant so they might raise the young countess from the dead. Then the old countess did as the young men said and promised them all the treasure she had if only they could bring her daughter back from the dead. So one of the young men approached the coffin and tapped the young countess lightly on the throat with a miraculous stick. She looked dead one minute and was alive the next. Everyone was delighted and now they would have a wedding instead of a wake. And they all ate and drank and had a very good time. The young men received a cart full of gold for their troubles and were so happy that they even gave the old man a sack of gold when they passed his house again. 
Strange as it may sound, they never tried their luck with the stick a second time because they still thought that the old man might have tricked them after all. So they all went back to school to complete their studies. So that is how this story ends. If you liked it, tell it to your friends. <laughs>